Different hearts, different dreams. Injective souls ignite the beams. No dream alone, no path ignored. Surjective wills knock every door. More hearts to thrive, or more dreams to grow. Two mighty sets now march toward battle. The wings of cardinality raise us high to the heaven of infinity. Be Previously, we discussed our ambition to study sets via properties of functions between them. Injectivity, surjectivity, and bijectivity are among the few properties of a function that don't require any extra structure on the sets, paving the way for discussions on cardinality, and are thus natural candidates to begin with. In this section, we'll go over their definitions and look at some examples. Let A and B be two sets, and let F be a function from A to B. We say that f is injective if, for any elements x1 and x2 in A, x1 not equal to x2 implies fx1 not equal to fx2. In other words, if we think of f as a machine, then distinct inputs produce distinct outputs. An injective function is also called a one-to-one -one function. Note that there might be elements sitting in the codomain that the function never touches. This does not violate the injectivity. We say that f is surjective if, for every y in b, there exists some x in a, such that fx equals y. In other words, everything in the codomain gets hit by someone in the domain under the map. The range and the codomain are exactly the same. A surjective function is also called an onto function. Note that there might be elements in the codomain that are achieved by more than one element in the domain. This is totally fine for a function to be surjective. Finally, we say that f is bijective if it is both injective and surjective. That is, there's a perfect match between the elements of A and the elements of B. No gaps, nor duplicates. It is also convenient to characterize these properties by looking at the preimage of each element in the codomain. Indeed, for any element y and b, the preimage of the singleton set should contain at most one element for an injective function at least one element for a surjective function, and exactly one element for a bijective function. In cases where the codomain of the function is the set of real numbers, this criterion is particularly easy to visualize. As y varies in the codomain, we can use a horizontal line to represent the current y value and observe how many times it intersects the graph of the function. Let us consider some examples. First, let f be a function from the set of non-negative real numbers to the real numbers, given by fx equals square of x. This function is injective, but not surjective. Indeed, if we look at any singleton set consisting of a negative number, the preimage is empty. Next, let f be a function from the real numbers to the set of non-negative real numbers, still given by fx equals x square. This function is surjective yet it is not injective. To see this, choose a singleton set consisting of a positive number y. The preimage consists of two distinct numbers, square root of y and negative square root of y. Similarly, if we still consider fx equals x squared, but this time let both the domain and the codomain be the set of non-negative real numbers, then for each y greater than or equal to zero, the preimage consists of exactly one element the square root of y. We conclude that the function is both injective and surjective, and hence bijective. Finally, if we still consider fx equals x squared, with both the domain and the codomain being the real numbers, then the function is neither injective nor surjective, as explained in the previous discussion. We summarize the conclusions in the following table. As you can see, Injectivity, surjectivity, and bijectivity depend not only on the rule of the map, but also on the choice of its domain and codomain. We hope you have now gained some familiarity with these basic concepts. In the next section, we'll explain, through examples, how to rigorously prove injectivity, surjectivity, and bijectivity. Shinla Tensei